Albert Einstein, Richard Branson, Bill Gates, John F. Kennedy, Tony Robbins, Michael Phelps, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of industries. What else do they have in common? Well, they all have ADHD, but you don't hear much about that, do you? You know what you hear even less about? The successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smartass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka. I'm an attorney, not a doctor, a lifelong student, not a coach. I'm also the creator of Cortography, a patent pending system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your superpowers, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest superpowers. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you, too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am Tracy Otsuka, and I wanted to welcome you to episode 33 of ADHD for Smartass Women. Today, I have invited Diane Winger to our podcast. Diane is a life coach for creatives and entrepreneurs who identify with ADHD, whether they're officially diagnosed or not. She has also been an adjunct faculty member with the USC School of Social Work, training graduate students to become therapists at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. During her 20-year career as a licensed psychotherapist, Diane saw far too many brilliant and capable women struggling with distractibility, procrastination, perfectionism, and self-doubt, which held them back from expressing their gifts in the world. Many of them were diagnosed with anxiety or depression and had no idea that the underlying issue was actually ADHD or ADD. We're going to use the term ADHD to cover inattentives today, as well as uh, those that are, oh my gosh, Diane, what's the term? You're inattentive or you're the one that means you're both? Combined or hyperactive. Yeah, well, combined type, exactly, um, including Diane herself. So after her own midlife diagnosis and diving deep into learning everything she could about how ADHD is expressed in women, Diane embraced coaching as a more effective and empowering way to move past limitations and live life to the fullest. She is now on a mission to help other gifted, creative, and entrepreneurial women of all ages to achieve their true potential through radical self-acceptance, leveraging their strengths, and creating an ADHD-friendly business and life. Diane, welcome. I have been so looking forward to this conversation, Tracy. Wonderful. So have I. You know what I also wanted to mention is that you are an expert on not only ADHD, but also cognitive behavioral therapy, which you have You have a different term. What, what do you call it? Well, when I was a therapist for a very long time, I practiced cognitive behavioral therapy with folks with ADHD and other diagnoses. But once I got my own diagnoses and realized that coaching was actually a better way of helping women like us, I shifted the paradigm and now do what I call cognitive behavioral coaching. I love that. I actually love that term much more than cognitive behavioral therapy because to me, there's an underlying I don't know, an underlying idea of you're going to be doing (laughs) rather than talking about doing. So let me tell you, last week I did a bunch of research and I recorded an episode all about the basics of cognitive behavioral therapy. And when I walked away, um, number one, I thought, oh my gosh, I've basically been cobbling together my life using cognitive behavioral type therapies. Number two, I loved how action-oriented it is, and action makes me happy. I have learned to pay attention to how I feel, and that when I do what I don't really want to do, but I know what's in my best interest, I become proud of myself, which makes me motivated, you know, more motivated to continue. I I've always have to be in that positive emotion. And then number three, out of all the things that we can do to deal with our ADHD, by golly, I think this is my favorite thing because it feels like I'm not trying to fit into that neurotypical box. It feels like what I'm doing is training my brain in a way that works for my brain. It seems so positive, so strength-focused, right up my alley. So 
Diane, what I want to do is I want to assume, and I know this is probably blasphemy, that one or more of our listeners may not have heard my last podcast on the basics of cognitive behavioral therapy. That was a joke, by the way. So I want to start at the beginning with the question, according to Diane, what is cognitive behavioral therapy and is it different than cognitive behavioral coaching to you? Okay. Excellent question. A great place to start. And just in case, someone hasn't heard the previous episode, don't don't do it right now, but right after this one, you want to go back and listen to that. Because your listeners are a wide variety of women, they're all smart, they're all smart asses, they all know or suspect they have ADHD, but maybe some of them have been to therapists, maybe some of them have worked with coaches, maybe some of them have never even heard of cognitive behavioral therapy before. So I'd like to start with that. Fundamentally, cognitive behavioral therapy is considered by most to be sort of the gold standard for evidence-based practice therapy. And that's kind of a big mouthful, but basically what it means is therapy, we have proof that it works. A lot of people, and I'm sure you know some too, go to therapy for years, (laughs) even decades. Yes. And there's no discernible change in their life. Well, That's totally unacceptable to me, both as a consumer of therapy services and as a practitioner. And the reason why cognitive behavioral therapy is so highly regarded is because it tracks and measures your progress over time. Now, I'm with you, Tracy. As far as ADHD goes, momentum is everything. If I'm not in momentum, I am symptomatic. And if I am symptomatic, I am not feeling good about myself and I'm not making progress, which is everything to me. So with cognitive behavioral therapy, you have homework, you are setting goals, you are tracking and monitoring your progress towards goals, you're addressing obstacles. You're right. It sounds like from what you've said, you actually figured out a way to do cognitive behavioral therapy on yourself. And I'm going to guess that a lot of women who are listening right now Once they hear what we have to say about it between this episode and the last, they will realize that a lot of their workarounds are really the same thing. Fundamentally, cognitive behavioral therapy rests on one basic premise. Your thoughts create your emotions. And so when you are upset, overwhelmed, feeling insecure, feeling threatened, aggravated, whatever that emotion is that is unpleasant to you. If you do not understand that the thoughts that you're thinking are the reason why you're experiencing that emotion, you're kind of SOL in that moment. You you just kind of have to let it happen. And a lot of women experience rejection-sensitive dysphoria and other emotional dysregulation uh, of their affect. So they, if they don't understand that their thoughts are where the action is, they're kind of helpless to help themselves out of it. So the basic understanding is you are in whatever situation you're in, you're having thoughts about, and by the way, situation might just be the thoughts you're having about yourself first thing in the morning when you look in the mirror. It could be that you're in a situation with your spouse or one of your kids or a coworker or your boss. It could be a situation like traffic or going to the market and then realizing you forgot your wallet. So the situation is whatever the circumstances are, either internal or external. Then there are your thoughts about it. They are the trigger for your emotions. Usually once emotions get involved, that's where we start having difficulty. Based on those emotions, we are going to take some kind of action or we will react or we will be unable to act at all. It's kind of like the fight, flight, or freeze. Mm -hmm. And then the outcome of those actions is going to be the consequences. So being able to kind of zoom in on our thoughts as the driver of really everything I mean, if you kind of work your way through this sequence, whatever situation you're in is kind of irrelevant. It just is. The thoughts you have about it are crucial because the thoughts trigger the emotions, positive, negative, or neutral. The actions you take are going to be based on those emotions, and the outcome you get is going to be based on all of the above. So 
understanding that you need to get to your thoughts and shift them when you don't like the way things are going, that's crucial. And fundamentally, just to wrap this part up, cognitive behavioral coaching, as opposed to cognitive behavioral therapy, has a few key differences. One is that even though you figured out through your workarounds, in a way, how to DIY your cognitive behavioral therapy, Traditionally, it requires that you are in a therapeutic relationship, it means you're going to a therapist's office, you're meeting with them regularly, usually once or twice a week, and you, generally speaking, it's a 12-week process. That's what a lot of insurance companies will pay for. Sometimes it's individual, sometimes it's group. So it's usually a formalized process. Um, you are usually seen for a specific So let's say you're dealing with anxiety, you're dealing with panic attacks, you're dealing with depression, or you're dealing with disorganization, overwhelm, procrastination, and some of the other traits or symptoms of ADHD. You you and your therapist will identify specific goals that you want to achieve in that 12 weeks, measure your progress, and at the end of the 12 weeks, you get a certificate and graduate. Coaching doesn't require you necessarily to be in a relationship with a coach. Now, you might want to work with a coach to teach you how to do this, but my goal as a cognitive behavioral coach is to empower my clients to learn how to manage their own minds because I don't want anyone to work with me forever. The goal is to teach you a set of skills and empower you to help yourself because you're going to have this mind and need to manage it for the rest of your life. I won't always be in your life. I just love, um, Diane, this whole idea that your thoughts control or create your emotions, because I believe 100% that that's true. So my question for you is, how in cognitive behavioral coaching or cognitive behavioral therapy do you change your thoughts? Because I can tell you that there are a lot of women that are listening to this saying, I can't do that. There's no way. My thoughts are my thoughts. You know, I don't blame them for thinking that. And I used to think the very same thing along with almost every client I've ever worked with. Even if they've heard, like there's a meme out there, thoughts create things. A lot of people have heard of it, but in real life, they don't believe it. And I think one of the reasons that women like us don't necessarily believe it off the top is that It's been said that the average human brain generates something like 80,000 thoughts a day. Well, I think our brains probably generate twice that many. (laughs) So when your brain is moving at the speed of light, that means your thoughts are coming fast and furious. And the idea that you could even interrupt that flow enough to see what the thoughts are seems preposterous. Now, I happen to be a big fan of meditation, and I know that that's a very controversial thing among people with ADHD because many will have the knee-jerk reflex. It's impossible. I can't be expected to sit down and make my mind go blank. Well, first of all, that's not what meditation is, and maybe we can talk about meditation another time. But meditation taught me that I can be the observer of my thoughts as well as the thinker of my thoughts. That realization was a game changer, Tracy, because being able to observe my thoughts meant, even if it only was for a moment, and when I first started meditating 10 years ago, it literally was just for a moment. I began to understand that I could pull back a little bit from the stream of my thoughts. And instead of feeling the way I imagine the metaphor I imagine is instead of being in the ocean caught in a riptide going head over tail, uh, unable to get myself upright and take a breath. That's how I used to feel about being in my thoughts, especially if they were very powerful, very negative thoughts about myself or someone else or a situation I was in. But being able to understand that I am the thinker of my thoughts. I am not my thoughts gave me a chance to learn that I could pause them. And when you can pause them just a little bit, and exercise also helps a lot with this, you can start to notice that some of your thoughts are positive, some of them are negative, and some of them are neutral. So 
being able to even notice that much is helpful because that means that in that moment of noticing, you are not in the thought. You're kind of standing back and looking at it. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. I I find myself doing this all the time. I almost, what I've said is I feel like there's my brain and then there's like, I don't know, maybe a little angel up above my brain who's watching my brain think. (laughs) Why don't we call that little angel your mind? Yes. I think this is where lots and lots of us get into trouble is that we're saying things like, oh, my brain made me do it, or my brain Mm -hmm. feels broken, or I don't understand how my brain worked. There's something wrong with my brain. I have brain fog, all of this stuff. But the truth is that the brain is the organ that you use to think with and many other things like breathe and move and work and so forth. Your mind is something separate entirely. And I don't want to get spiritual, but some people Mm -hmm. think of it as the soul or the person. I I just like to think of it as the essence and the brain is the tool. So one of the things I teach my clients is your mind is the boss of your brain. Your brain is the boss of your body. So here's a quick little example of cognitive behavioral coaching in real time. If you are thinking the thought, there's something wrong with me. And frankly, I thought that for many, many years, there's something wrong with me. And when I was feeling particularly dramatic, I would say, there's something terribly wrong with me. (laughs) So something terribly, horribly, no good, very bad, and very wrong with me, to partially quote the children's book. So when I was thinking the thought, there's something wrong with me, Naturally, I'm getting upset. I'm getting frustrated. I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm feeling sad. I'm feeling disgusted. Uh, Just a whole stew pot of negative emotions. But my brain is not the one thinking that thought. My mind is. And my mind is the part of us, our mind is the part of us that should be in control, but we often don't feel it is. And my goal is to help people understand, among other things, the difference between their mind and their brain so that they can feel more in charge. So the thought, what's the matter with me? Why am I, you know, why do I keep screwing up and so forth? You know, you give your brain a question like that and it's going to run and find you an answer. So if the question is, what the hell is the matter with me? or why do I keep doing this? Or why can't I get my shit together? Those are a few popular ones. Mm -hmm. Your brain is like a research librarian. It'll be like, wait right here. I'll go get you an answer. And (laughs) it will go look quickly through your memory files and come back with a whole (laughs) lap full of every regrettable thing you've ever done and saying, see, see, this is why. But if you ask your brain a better question, if you slow down for just a second and think, wait a minute, maybe it's this thought, what the hell is the matter with me or why can't I get my shit together that's actually causing my distress instead of that thought simply being an observation of reality, you ask your brain a different question like, what's the first step I need to take to figure this out? Or what can I do right now to calm down? It's just another thought, but it's a thought that's going to generate calm. It's going to generate focus. It's going to generate creative problem solving, not more upset and overwhelmed. You see the difference? Yes. The goal is that you are getting your mind to actually think and pay attention versus letting your emotion take over everything so that your mind has no, your mind thinks that it's you know it's paralyzed it can't do anything right and it that leads long. to right exactly right and that leads to i would say whether we're talking about a very high functioning woman or a woman who's just really struggling just to get out of bed one of the key things that i've seen with nearly every woman with adhd that i have worked with is a struggle to maintain a positive sense of self esteem on a regular basis some more than others well that to me is something that you can absolutely reprogram your mind around no matter how much evidence you think you have for what a screw up you are 
And Diane, do you think that is because of just ADHD generally, or do you think it's because of the experience that many women, people with ADHD have had if they struggled in the school system, if they were constantly told to, you know, stop talking, to sit down, to stop moving? Where do you think that comes from? That's a really good question. I have a lot of thoughts about this and (laughs) what it comes down to, I think, because I did well in school. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have the more, quote unquote, typical ADHD experience of difficulty in school. I actually did very well in school. And there are women with ADHD who excel in certain environments where I got a lot of my self-esteem struggles was in relationships. Mm. And I think whether we're talking about struggling in school, struggling at work, struggling in relationships, or just struggling, period, one of the main reasons why women with ADHD have challenges with self-esteem is because I believe from a very, very early age, we know we're different. Mm. Before anyone gives us any kind of negative feedback that reinforces that notion, I believe that we are very intuitive and very aware. And one of the first things you become aware of as a child is that you're different from other people. Now, kids are so good at pointing things out. Kids that are taller, shorter, fatter, skinnier, have braces, have glasses, have red hair, whatever the thing that makes you different is, other kids love to point that stuff out. Adults like to point out differences too. Why can't you sit still like your brother? Why can't you get your homework done? Why are you, why don't you seem to listen when I'm talking to you? Right? Don't Mm -hmm. you care? So when adults, well-meaning adults in most cases, parents, grandparents, tutors, teachers, Bible school teachers, soccer coaches, you name it, when they are pointing out your difference, meaning you're not either appearing or behaving in the way that they expect that you would, they're going to point it out. And a lot of times in a very negative way. So I think children learn very early in life that difference is bad. Being different means something's wrong, even if you're not being shamed for it. So I think that one of the reasons why so many women don't get diagnosed until much later in life is because we become very skilled at hiding. We try to cover up all the things that are different about us so that we can be accepted, so that we can fit in, so that we can belong and not get negative attention brought to ourselves or criticism. And I think one of the reasons why so many women with ADHD have uh, issues with rejection And depression is because even before someone says something negative to us, we can often feel it. I don't know about you, Tracy, but ever since I was a little girl, I believed I could tell right away whether someone liked me or not. Totally. And and I could tell right away whether I liked them or not, too. Exactly. Before they even spoke sometimes, just walking into the room and feeling the energy. Yeah. And when I and when I would talk to someone who wasn't like us, they would say, "Don't be ridiculous," or "You're jumping to Uh conclusions," or "How could she dislike you? She doesn't even know you." Yeah. And yet, that what that also taught me, and this also feeds into the self esteem issue. What that taught me was, I must be wrong, and I can't trust my own mind. I can't trust my own thoughts. What seems so obvious to me. This person doesn't like me. My teacher doesn't like me. My neighbor doesn't like me. My my best friend's mother doesn't like whatever it is. I knew it. And then I was told, no, you're wrong. So I doubted myself. And that continued for many, many years. So I think those are just a couple of the reasons why we tend to struggle with self-esteem. And this is irregardless of how quote unquote accomplished or successful we may be in life. It's kind of this chronic underlying, I'm just not so sure of myself. And that is a great thing to work on 
in terms of shifting your thoughts, because that will totally change the way you feel about yourself and even the nature of thoughts your mind will produce in the future. You know, my theory on that, Diane, too, is the only way that you can then start to trust yourself is to be to stop trying to fit in and to be willing to stand out, to figure out where it is that you're brilliant and start being visible around it, because then your people are going to be able to see that you're their people and they will come to you and you'll be able to build a network of people that are just like you. So that's my theory. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I have a t-shirt that I love so much that says, you're going to be too much for some people. They're not your people. Yes. When I wear that shirt, I actually just wore it a few days ago. I was very happy to see how many young women said, I love your shirt. I love it too. I'm going to have to find out where you got that. Oh, give me your address offline and I'll send you one. <laughs> I, I love it. And I think a lot of us, especially those of us who are hyperactive, although my sense is when you're hyperactive, you're too much because you tend to be loud. You tend to talk a lot. You know, you tend to be the center of attention versus if you're inattentive, you're too much because you're probably more emotional. Correct? Oh, this is such... We <laughs> can actually do a whole other podcast episode on this because... I happen to be combined type. I suspect you are too. Me too. And so I have the the hyperactive and impulsive traits as well as inattentive and, and distractible. Have now, you, Diane, have you ever met anybody that's purely hyperactive? Because I've never heard of anybody like that. I don't even know why that's a type. I see it sometimes in men. Hmm. Yeah, I see it sometimes in men. But, you know, personally, I believe that the categories really need to be changed along with the name for the diagnosis. Yes. It sucks. And it's really inaccurate. It is. But anyway, back to the question. My, I, I have three kids. I passed on ADD, ADHD to all three of them before I even <laughs> knew I had it myself. Thanks, mom. Wow. And my oldest son is combined type. And my second son and my daughter are both inattentive, distractible. And my daughter and I have had so many funny conversations where she says, you know what, mom, I think you guys, meaning the combined type, are having all the fun with this. She says, it's not so fun being inattentive and distractible. At least you guys get to do wild and outrageous things while you're being hyperactive and impulsive. And I said, you know what? I think you might have a point there. I, I agree with that. I do think that certainly the women that struggle the most are the inattentives. I, I completely agree with that. And I think that means for them, and I have lots of opportunities to coach my daughter. Mm -hmm. I think for women who are inattentive and distractible, lots of times the self-esteem struggles are really more profound than they are for you and I. And all the more reason why it would be well in their interest to learn a skill like cognitive behavioral self-coaching so they can manage their own mind. Because when you get into rumination, overthinking, second guessing, and just a mass of self-doubt, I call it a think hole. Oh, think hole. Oh you, know, you know, think hole. This, it's a think hole. And it, <laughs> there's just no way to get yourself out, Tracy. You can just, I mean, I've known people who can get themselves into a think hole and stay there for days and wow. just be so miserable. Well, the good news is there, there is a way out, even of a very deep think hole. And it starts with being willing to believe you can. Now, that may sound like, wait a minute, that's the first step? I, I think yes. And the reason why is I worked in the medical system for a long time. As you mentioned, I was at Children's Hospital LA for many years teaching future therapists. And one of the things I noticed is everybody's obviously heard of the placebo effect. Mm -hmm. You might have also heard of the nocebo effect. The nocebo effect, which by the way, I did not make it up. When I first heard about it, I'm like, come on. The nocebo effect is if you think you're going to have negative side effects, you will. The placebo effect is ah. if you think this medication, this surgery, this injection, mm -hmm. whatever is going to benefit you, it will. Now, here's a little aside. This is proof positive of how powerful the human mind is. 
at that time, I was working with young kids and teaching people how to work with young kids, some of whom had cancer and other very serious medical issues. We were teaching the kids, this was back in the 90s, how to use a Pac-Man game to imagine the medication they were receiving gobbling up their cancer cells. I love that. And I think the kids who got better were the ones who could readily engage with that belief system. Some of the kids didn't even want to play the game. They said, that's ridiculous. And I, I think there's just no telling how much we can do for ourselves when we are first willing to believe it's possible. And I would imagine everybody listening to this podcast is probably already in that camp mm -hmm. because people that don't believe it's possible to improve their lives are probably not interested in a podcast like this to begin with. Right. Wow. Okay. So I want to ask you, when we're talking about cognitive behavioral therapy or cognitive behavioral coaching, who is a candidate for it and who is not? I had written some notes to myself beforehand on my whiteboard, and I'm looking at one that says, what are its limitations? So you went right where, right where, <laughs> where go. Perfect. Perfect. So I do think there are limitations. I, now, I have referred to cognitive behavioral therapy, or in my case, cognitive behavioral coaching as kind of the gold standard of the Cadillac of therapies because it's evidence-based and we can prove it works. And there's lots and lots and lots of published research that says there's a lot of therapies that just take money and time and you're no better off. But this one, this one works, but not for everybody and not at every point in time. So I personally, you know, I have a lot of experience working with people in all kinds of different scenarios. And I believe that when someone has a serious addiction, mm. a serious uh abuse history combined with ongoing effects like post-traumatic stress disorder. When they have really profoundly body-based emotional dysregulation. What um, does that mean, body-based? Basically, it means that they are experiencing their emotions. You could call that a somatic effect. Um, there are people that get diagnosed with somatoform disorders, with somatic somatization disorders and so forth. What it essentially means is it's very, very difficult to get past their emotions to their thoughts because their thoughts to emotions to sensations is so profound. They literally feel their feelings in their body on such a profound basis that I mean, I have worked with kids in the past and adults as well, who there was actually nothing physically wrong with them, mm -hmm. but they believed that they were sick or they were diseased or they were deformed or they, their belief that there was something physically wrong with their body was so profound, their mind actually created physical symptoms. That was fascinating. But what it essentially but it also shows you how strong the mind is that it can do that. Absolutely. And when you combine how strong the mind is with how fast our minds are, you get some idea ah. of why so many of us are really emotionally reactive. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I do in the, with the clients I work with before, actually, before we even get together, I have to do an assessment of whether they're appropriate for working with me because I want to maintain a great reputation and have good outcomes for every single one of my clients. So there are people that I won't work with because I know that it won't turn out well. And one of the reasons for that is I first assess their level of sensitivity, their level of reactivity, and their level of hardiness. And what that basically means is if they are experiencing their emotions so rapidly, so profoundly, and in such a physical way that they're literally, their mind is making themselves sick, they're not a good candidate. If they are deep, deep, deep into an addiction, mm -hmm. they really need to get help with the addiction first or at the same time as trying to do cognitive behavioral work. A lot of women with ADHD, and I know that you're aware of this because I'm in your Facebook group, a lot of women with ADHD struggle with compulsive disorders, eating disorders, and all, all kinds of addictive type behaviors or habitual behaviors. 
And so I think that it really depends on the level. And also, it, so, so let me back up a little bit. They have to be willing to believe it's possible that their thoughts create their reality. If they don't believe that, they won't believe that. I'm not going to waste my time trying to convince them. They can figure it out on their own and come back later when they're ready. Well, it's such common sense, isn't it? No, Tracy, there's no such thing as common sense. (laughs) To me, it's just all you have to do is with your mind go through some sort of thing that you blew out of proportion, that you were sure this is why X happened, and you go back and you realize, oh, I just made that all up in my mind. It didn't even happen that way. No, 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 my dear. You are way ahead of the masses. Uh, okay, I know. And I know it's confusing sometimes that, mm-hmm. I, and I think one of the things that's just completely, just as an aside, confusing about ADHD is because it's such a spectrum condition mm-hmm. from the very, very mild to the, you don't have ADD, come on, to the profound, like strangers on the street are coming up and telling you you have ADD, right? Yeah. And then there are, there's level of intelligence and that has an impact. There's level of emotional resiliency and coping strategies that plays a part, whether you've had a lot of trauma or abuse, whether you have other comorbid conditions. I mean, there's so much variance, but I would say I gave up the belief in common sense years ago when I saw so little evidence of it. (laughs) And what I'm saying by that is that I think maybe for you, it's common sense that when you, let's say, have a grown up tantrum and then realize, oh, shit, I completely blew that out of proportion because I told myself a story in my mind and then I believed it. We all do that. We just don't know. Like, here's an example. Everybody, every human, not just the ADD one. Everyone is talking to themselves all the time, all the time. We are basically narrating our existence moment by moment by moment. We are commenting on ourselves. We're commenting on other people. We're commenting on our observations. We are making assumptions about why other people are doing what they're doing. We are making predictions and we are creating our own reality every minute. Most people don't know that. Now, occasionally they may know or can be convinced, sometimes well after the fact, that they created a total shit show in their mind and then acted it out in real life. And then later they're like, oh my God. It <laughs> can happen more with folks that are on the hyperactive impulsive side. Right. Of them, for obvious reasons. I mean, I can tell you Sometime we should have a cocktail and a Zoom call. And I will tell you some of my most profoundly regrettable moments. <laughs> they're, they're really, I, if, maybe I'll write a book someday under a pen name so no one will know it was me. But I did a lot of really outrageous things in my youth and a lot of them reactions and romantic scenarios and so forth. But I think the awareness that our thoughts create our reality, our thoughts create our emotions, and that there's actually something we can do about it is big news for most humans. And you know, the minute I said that, I remembered that three years ago, I I mentioned this in the podcast, and then I was thinking, oh my gosh, why did I even bring that up? It's embarrassing. But I, um, three years ago, I don't know how I found Abraham Hicks, but Mm -hmm. I did. And to this day, I will say, if I could have any woman's brain in the whole world, it would be Esther Hicks. But when I first started listening three years ago, I thought, what the heck? This is just (laughs) weird. But the more I listened, the more I realized that when I got away from the channeling and the hoo woo and all that, it made perfect sense to me. But when I started, I thought, this is nutty. What am I listening to? Why am I, you know, I was cleaning my closet and I needed to listen to something. So I, I hear what you're saying. You know, to me, it's so obvious now, but it's over a three year period. Well, we are notorious for having bad memories. And I think you simply forgot that you didn't always feel this way. <laughs> <laughs> I know. To- totally. Absolutely. What else we vary a lot on in terms of the spectrum is that, and this has zero to do with ADHD, or maybe it does. Maybe it has something to do with how creative the majority of us are, is the degree of woo woo that we embrace. And 
you know, I'm very much trained in the sciences and neuroscience. I, you know, have a strong medical background and a previous career in the medical field. And so I, I really like looking at the brain from a neuroscience perspective. However, I will say I happen to be a practicing Buddhist, so which is extremely compatible with cognitive behavioral work, by the way. But I, I think that as I get older, especially, I recognize I'm not as anti-woo-woo as I used to be. Yeah. I used to think, oh, that's a bunch of hooey. But <laughs> honestly, I can have in-depth conversations with my sister and friends and other people who tell me about their tarot card readings and their channeling sessions and all of their their special candles and rocks and so forth. I don't partake of much of that, but I will say at this point, I am no longer anti-woo-woo. No, I'm not even anti-woo. I'm, I'm saying I'm about half a woo. Uh, I'm, about, I'm about halfway into half of woo-woo. And that's about as far as I've gone. But who knows? Ask me again in five years and I may be in up to my eyelashes. I don't know. Yeah. No, I. it has really changed. And, and I wonder too, it's changed my thoughts and my acceptance. And I wonder if a lot of it too, that you said that there's a lot of woo with ADHD is because of the intuition. You know, if yes. you not rely on your brain a hundred percent, you start building other skills. Yeah, and so, absolutely true. And the creativity, because I think, yes. um, you know, the sciences are non-negotiable, Tracy. Right. They, they just are hard, cold yeah. facts. But uh, when it comes to spirituality, it's a wide open playing field. Mm -hmm. it, really, <laughs> it really is. Okay. I want to ask you one more question about who cognitive behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral coaching is for and is not for. And one of, one of the things that I did a, a podcast on rejection sensitive dysphoria, and they basically, you know, the the research that I did seemed to indicate that only a third of people respond to these two forms of medication and the rest of the people, it was sort of like, well, there's not a whole lot that we can do. Well, once I started to research cognitive behavioral therapy, I, I'm just, what do you mean? There's nothing. I, I, to me, it seems like cognitive behavioral therapy would be perfect for rejection sensitive dysphoria because it would constantly be forcing the, I don't know if you call it the patient, the student to, uh, what am I, to take all the thoughts that they have and put them in the light of day. I love that. Well, first of all, I am an eternal optimist, always have been, and I simply reject on face value any practitioner telling me there's nothing more we can do. Yeah. There's always something you can do. And I think the more things that you can do for yourself, yes, the more empowered and strong and healthy and confident you will feel. So here's my take on this. I think that cognitive behavioral therapy or cognitive behavioral coaching, even a DIY version, as I said, you know, I work with my clients for 12 weeks and over that 12 weeks, I teach them how to coach themselves so that they don't need me anymore. I love and, that. Well, it's, the thing, you know, that's one of the things, one of the reasons why I'm not a therapist anymore is because therapy had often the goal of healing, which I think is important when there's been abuse or trauma, serious losses and so forth. But at some point you should be healed and you should be able to move on or at least have some decent scar tissue and get on with your life. Right. I think oftentimes with therapy, it would just go on and on and on. And I, at one point I realized the goal of therapy beyond healing seems to be insight. And my opinion is that insight is not enough. I think people want change. And if what you want is change because you don't think your life is working the way you want it to, or there are certain areas where you want it to be improved, or everything is just hunky-dory and you just want to level up, there's a lot you can do for yourself and a lot you can do for yourself as a woman with ADHD. So as I said before, I think if you are in the grips of a serious addiction, you need to, to manage the addiction before you can really benefit from cognitive therapy. I think if you are in a seriously self-injurious relationship with your body, meaning you are cutting, burning, or doing mm -hmm. other things that are very compulsive that some women with ADD do, 
that should be addressed therapeutically. If you are a somaticizer and you are experiencing your emotions very much in your body so that you, you don't even really have the ability to yet get to your thoughts, that too. But for the rest of us, and not just women with ADHD, human beings, yes, we all have a mind, we all have a brain, and we all have work to do and relationships with other people. So when wouldn't it be appropriate to learn how to manage the mind you've got? I think that everyone can benefit from some form of CBT. And specifically, I would think for women with ADHD who are not in the throes of addiction or dealing with abuse Mm -hmm. or trauma or self-injurious behavior, everyone else it would be appropriate for. Some of the key areas where I would see it being most appropriate and most helpful and nearly immediately beneficial are emotional regulation. If you're someone who gets overwhelmed, gets upset, gets frustrated, gets just gets triggered uh, easily and then kind of derailed by your own yeah, emotions. Spirals down. Spirals down. So we'll just call that overwhelm. That's an excellent indication for CBT or CBC. R- rumination, people yeah. who do a lot of the, you know, it's like, I think, I know I've already sworn, but here I go again. It's kind of a <laughs> fuck in your brain where you are ruminating, overthinking, second guessing, self-doubting, and it just goes around and around. That is an excellent, excellent indication for CBT. Self-esteem, self-confidence. You have a desire to go bigger in your life, pursue goals, go after your dreams, start a business, you know, pursue that hot guy, whatever it is. I practice radical self-acceptance. And a lot of that depends on deleting the disempowering thoughts and replacing them with empowering ones. And then I'd say the last major category would be relationships. A lot of women with ADHD really struggle in relationships, even when they shine everywhere else. As for me, I've been married three times. And I can say currently in my current relationship for 23 years. You got the third one right. Finally. However, I will say publicly, because I don't know how many people are listening to this, I would absolutely say not only my divorces, but how I got into my previous marriages and why I stayed in them, all under the influence of unidentified, unmanaged ADHD. And I I did harm there. I put my kids through a lot. I, you know, and I put myself through a lot. And so I think the area of relationships is one, especially if your partner is a neurotypical. There's a lot that you can do. And this is not marriage counseling or anything. It's like managing your mind so that you're managing your side of the relationship is very beneficial. So you absolutely believe that you can change your self-concept with cognitive behavioral therapy or cognitive behavioral coaching. I not only believe it, I'm living proof that it's possible. And have you worked with women who have um, or who had rejection sensitive dysphoria and it really made a big difference? Absolutely. Sometimes, depending on how profound their symptoms are and how many other things they may have going on, we can have an excellent outcome. Sometimes it takes longer than the 12 weeks I usually work with clients. And I, I have options for working longer with clients if necessary, but it really depends on how well-developed RSD is and how much it's impairing their day-to-day life. Sometimes we have to go a little slower because as you can tell, I have a very strong personality. <laughs> I know. And no, I'm, I'm, just, I, I'm beyond the point where I'm holding anything back. This is like no right. half, half for me. It's full strength DW. But sometimes I have to dial myself back just a little bit when I'm working with certain clients with RSD because they might perceive my direct approach to be triggering. Right. So sometimes that's something that, you know, we have to really assess up front if I'm a good fit or if they would be better served by someone who's a little bit less dynamic, shall we say. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And that's the perfect note to, um, to end or wrap up. But before you go, I would love if you would tell people who want to learn more about you, where they can find you. And also, if you could talk to us a little bit about if there's anything special that you're working on that you want to tell us about. 
Thank you so much for asking. As a matter of fact, there is. <laughs> so my current website is dianewingertcoaching.com, and I'm sure you'll be linking to it in the show notes. But for the last few months, I've been working on preparing to launch my own podcast, and it is called The Driven Woman. I love the name. Thank you. I do too. I'm also working on a book by the same name. And just for your listeners, because I, it's not going to be launched by the time this goes live. I will give you a special link where if they would like to be the first to be notified when the podcast goes live, and if they would like an extra special information sheet on, do you know if you're a driven woman that only they will get, I'll be happy to provide you with that link. You know, I was planning on using ADHD in the title of my podcast and so that it would be easily found, but What I understand from all the years that I've been working with women like us is that the majority of women like us don't even know it. Absolutely. There's, I mean, we're just the tip of the iceberg. Those of us who actually know whether we've been officially identified or not is irrelevant. We somehow thought this could be me and we followed our curiosity to ADHD. But a lot of women out there who are brilliant but feel that they're broken, don't even know they're one of us. So I decided to name it something that might appeal to women like us who might not yet know they're a card-carrying member of the ADHD club. And because I've always been so driven and it's been the source for most of my success, it was a natural title for me to go with. You know, what's so funny, Diane, is that when I, you know, because I, I was diagnosed, my son was diagnosed, then eight months later I was diagnosed, but I was still questioning it. And it Mm -hmm. wasn't until I discovered that two things were symptoms of ADHD, interpersonal intuition, and drivenness was a form of hyperactivity. Yes, ma'am. That it was like, ding, 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 ding. Like, (laughs) I finally was able to embrace it and say, okay, yep, that's me. So I, I think it's a really, really great name. And I am very excited to, so when did, when do you think you're going to be launching it? Uh, I'm not ready to give the date yet, but we're looking at this fall. So it's coming soon. Okay. No, I can't wait to hear your podcast. So thank you so much for sharing your knowledge here with us. I love the way you deliver information. It's so measured and it's so calm and somehow my brain is able to soak it in (laughs) because the way you deliver information is so different than the way I deliver information. Well, here's my secret. I've learned how to drive a race car with the emergency brake on. Oh yeah, that's That's, right. that's That's what I call how I've learned to kind of Right. Ride my natural forcefulness so that I can be a little bit more accessible to people. Rather than the Ferrari engine with the bicycle brakes, right? Boom. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so thank you so much, uh, Diane. And that is what we have for you for this week. As always, you're listening to ADHD for Smart Ass Women. If you like this episode with Diane, please let us know by leaving a review. My goal is to change the conversation around ADHD, helping as many women as I possibly can learn how their ADHD brains work and discover their amazing strengths. Your reviews really help in that regard. Look, we're all in this together, trying to learn all that we can about our incredible ADHD brains and affect positive change. I need you. So if you have a comment, a guest you'd like me to interview, or a topic idea for this podcast, You can go to my website at tracyoutsuka.com, leave me an audio message, or reach out to me at tracy at tracyoutsuka.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Outsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Play. If you liked what you heard, we sure would appreciate a review. And not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, well, that's also the name of our free Facebook group. Go look it up. We're a totally smart ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. We'd love to have you join us. You can also find all my details over at tracyoutsuka.com. Don't forget, I spy a happier life for us. And I'll see you again next week.